I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about ketosis. Take home message is despite experts for at least the last five, six plus years publishing theoretical papers, this has the potential to help all sorts of conditions. And despite increase in popularity in keto diets in the general population. And despite some case studies, anecdotal reports, there is a big deficit in any case control clinical studies looking at whether keto diets, ketogenesis is helpful in any of these conditions. So the bottom line is the data so far is theoretical concerns, sort of epidemiological and correlative issues of why it might work, a handful of case reports for most of these different conditions, and an analogy to epilepsy, which is a condition that for a hundred years has been treated in some cases by inducing ketosis. Cells in our body normally are getting their energy from glucose, simple sugar. There's some glucose floating around in our blood all the time because the cells are continually being active, continually need to be fed. Most of the glucose is stored in our liver in a more complicated molecule called glycogen, which is just a string of glucoses stuck together when energy demands, either through exercise or other factors, mental exercise, brain using it, the muscles using it, other even bone cells and others are metabolically active, so they are consuming some small amounts of glucose all the time. Anyway, when glucose levels start to drop, normally the liver starts cleaving up the glycogen and making more glucose available. But when that glycogen is depleted, so in states of intermittent fasting, in states of starvation, there's no glycogen around and the brain needs to have its energy or cells start dying. So what the liver also does is to start breaking down fatty acids into what are called ketones. And the three ketones in the human bodies that the liver breaks down fatty acids to are acetone, acetoacetic acid, and beta-hydroxybutyrate, which BHB is the main one circulating in the body. So in a normal condition, Glucose levels are close to the 100 range. Ketone levels are 0.1 or 0.2, so those are considered trace levels. But again, when the glycogen is depleted, when glucose is dropping, the ketone levels are somewhere at least 0.5. Some would say they have to be at least 1 to be in a state of ketosis. Some would say 1 to 3 or 1 to 5 or 1 to 7. I've seen all sorts of slightly different ranges, but almost... 10 times higher than the trace levels normally found are states of ketosis. Just as an aside, there's a more dangerous state. So in diabetic ketoacidosis, that is a state of ketosis for type 1 diabetics who are dependent on insulin. And in that, the ketone levels rise often above 25, even, even higher. And the danger there is not just the presence of so many ketones in them, blood in the brain and the body, but because there is an acid-base imbalance and diabetic ketoacidosis commonly puts people into comas and untreated can often kill people. So we're not talking about ketones in that range. The brain, even though the brain cells, both neurons and astrocytes usually use glucose as their primary energy source. They also can avidly use ketones and effectively use ketones as an energy source. But it is a different molecule and it has ramifications on lots of different levels. The liver itself doesn't make much good use of ketones, so it really needs glucose. The brain, again, usually uses glucose that can make good use of ketones. In ketosis, there is a decrease in inflammation, both in the general body and within the brain. And we know that depression, anxiety, their conditions are correlated with states of higher neuroinflammation and higher states of body inflammation. We also know that ketosis results in changes in the microbiome. And again, there's lots of communication between what's going on in your, within your gut and neurotransmitters are circulating, what other 
probably influences back into inflammation itself and can serve as signaling to the brain, actually promote the synthesis of certain neurotransmitters, doing things like serotonin, dopamine, adenosine. That's potentially a beneficial effect of states of ketosis. And one of the big ones and one that may unite many of these other biological changes is that state of ketosis promotes new synthesis of mitochondria or organelles within the cell, which one big job is to generate energy. Evolutionarily, they were probably primitive microorganisms that entered another microorganism and were incorporated within it. So the genes of your mitochondria actually all come from your mother's side. So when they are deficient or weak or defective, cells get energy depleted, but mitochondria clearly have lots of other functions in the body, including particularly regulating the epigenome. So again, the genome is the genes you inherit from both your parents. That's important for limiting propensities or increasing risks or giving you certain traits, but more importantly or equally importantly with the blueprint, the genes that you inherit is which genes are being read at a given time and which cells in the body are reading. So all your genes are not active throughout your body throughout time. Epigenome is a system of modulating the DNA so that some genes are turned off, some are revved up, some are switched on and off repeatedly. And mitochondria are intimately connected with that epigenome regulation with depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, ADD, autism, dementia. We see states of high inflammation, or at least correlation. We see changes in neurotransmitter levels. So it's logical, it's plausible that inducing a state of ketosis could be helpful for all these conditions. At an epidemiologic level, it seems that most of these conditions are more prevalent in modern society than they were even 20 years ago or 40 years ago. And there's a correlation with an increase in obesity worldwide and also an increase in what's called metabolic syndrome. So it's not just people are heavier, but people have glucose levels and lipid levels that are more poorly regulated and higher and elevated. So both at an individual level and at a population level, we're seeing these disturbances of metabolism that seem to correlate or track with worsening mental health. There's still a lot of debate and absolutely no certainty as to what is the underlying trigger. Some people cite environmental distress that so we're living in more stressful times with bigger flood of information and demands upon our life and quicker decision making and less thoughtful reflection and quiet. Some have cited environmental toxins, which could be changing us at hormonal levels. Others cite specifically our diets, that our diets have changed substantially with more additives, more sugar, more other things that may not be good for us in the long run, even though they're appealing. All of these factors might be going on. There could be other infectious agents or other effects of changes in global warming, just ambient temperature. Nobody knows what the source of all these things are going on. But again, there's plausible reasons to think that ketosis, inducing states of ketosis could have beneficial effects to the brain. So this argument is strengthened in different directions. One is that there is a hundred year history of treating epilepsy. So epilepsy is a condition of repeated seizures. Many individuals get effective treatment through medications or multiple medications. Other people have seizures that are poorly controlled. And it was found more than a hundred years ago that a ketogenic diet inducing states of ketosis help the frequency or in some kids completely eliminated seizures when they were having regular, even daily or multiple times a day seizures. Inflammation is lower and there are changes in their microbiome. There's changes in their neurotransmitters. So inducing ketosis has changes on the brain and beneficial ones for people, subset of people with seizures. Growing body of anecdotal or what I call case report studies and Chris Palmer, a Harvard psychiatrist, is one of the strongest generators of these. So he's treated people with schizophrenia, with OCD, with anxiety disorders, with depression, just with a 
diet that induces ketosis. And in people who were poorly managed on modern medications and getting substandard results, he has a number who within a few days, person with schizophrenia, whose hallucinations went away completely. People with depression, where the depression result, people with OCD who stopped their compulsions or obsessions. And many of these individuals, when they interrupted their ketosis, when they went back to a more normal diet, within one to two days, they had a recurrence of their symptoms, whether they were hallucinations or compulsions or obsessions or depression. Many of these individuals did remain on their medications. Some of them have been able to reduce their medications, but he's not promoting yet that people with these severe disabling conditions just stop their medications and try ketosis instead. It stems also to dementia and mild cognitive impairment or milder version of dementia. There have been Again, anecdotal and some group observations of people on ketogenic diet or ketosis inducing diets who appeared to function better in their daily lives, who appeared to think more quickly, more sharply, a better recall. The big question though is why, given that the analogy to epilepsy has been around for a hundred years, there have been experts pushing this as a possible solution for a variety of mental health treatments for many, many years now. Why don't we have controlled clinical studies really testing in a formal way whether this works or not? I'm not saying anecdotal evidence doesn't suggest it works. It strongly suggests it does. I think some of the misinformation about COVID is a wonderful example doctor treats his patient because he believes hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin are going to treat it. One person comes in the door, they give some of these medicines, which repeated controlled studies demonstrate do not have a significant impact, but the person does well. And the issue with COVID was that, you know, more than 98 and a half percent, 99, depending on what group and age and study, you know, most people aren't going to die from COVID. Most people got over it. Did they get over it because of your treatment? Did they get over it because they were just going to get over it anyway? It's a little different here. We're talking about chronic mental health conditions. Still plausible though, there are large placebo effects or large other effects in most mental health research studies, looking at small numbers of people with even dramatic results, it is hard to know again. Maybe it's something just circular or strange to that individual and that this is not going to be a generally helpful treatment. So that's why we need to do controlled clinical studies. There are big formal studies in depression and a few other conditions. I do not know of any studies designed or on progress right now looking at this for ADHD, but certainly for autism, for dementia, for depression, there are studies in the works ongoing. Chris Palmer, again, he's probably the, the world expert on ketosis for mental health conditions. So he describes that he has good success in helping people stick with the keto diet for two reasons. One is he's seeing them regularly, weekly, so he can encourage, provide specific guidance and help. And two, with his patients who are getting good results, they can see they get worse if they deviate from it and get off. On the other hand, if you're trying to pitch this to volunteers in a study, ways we commonly induce it. ketosis is intermittent fasting and or a diet that is extremely low or lacking carbohydrates and high in proteins and fats. So if you tell a person no carbohydrates at all, that seems bleak and difficult for most people to be consistent with, particularly in the early stages. If you are doing it in a dementia population, you have to convince caretakers, even if people are willing to be subjects, many of them may have a difficult time sticking to it or adhering to it. So that seems to be one of the big difficulties. Another difficulty is that this is something people could try on their own. So if you're already found that ketosis helped with your depression or helped with your ADHD or others, why would you need to go volunteer to be in a study or trial doing it? Because you can just 
do it yourself. You have access to this treatment. Getting back to individualized medicine, people vary tremendously in how much of a dietary change and how much of a fasting regimen is needed to induce ketosis. So I've just been playing around this little blood measures of ketosis. What I was reading is that after 16 hours of fasting, so I eat dinner at six, don't eat food next morning till 10 a.m. And particularly including exercise is another way to deplete glucose stores in your body. And I'm fairly slim to begin with, even after about 16 hours of fasting with an hour running and two hours of very vigorous gardening. Only two days, small sample size, my keto levels were 0.1 one day and 0.2 the next day. So trace levels. So for me, it's probably going to be harder to get into a state of ketosis. So one of the shortcuts of different approaches, and there's debate among scientists in this field, is to, so you can just drink ketones and boost your ketone levels. It creates a state of ketosis, but usually if you're just adding them on, then you are in a state of high ketones and probably normal levels, values of glucose. If it's just the ketone level that matters, that should be a successful approach. Others argue the other side that it's not just the presence of the ketones, it's ketones in the presence of lower glucose levels that are what's important. And just taking ketones without lowering your glucose isn't going to have a beneficial effect. Dietitians and weight loss experts have also cautioned that a ketone ketosis diet is not a sustainable one, that you're causing one longer term problematic issues with the digestive system. So you may not be getting enough fiber deficient in certain vitamins. There are potential downsides for this. Certainly, if you already have conditions like diabetes or some other gastrointestinal condition, you should not start this unless you're being supervised by medical professionals. I think it's quite likely we may find that this is a powerful aid to a number of conditions. But the data is so far really underwhelming. Stay healthy, stay healthy, and bye. 